Orville Redenbacher was sent to Earth with only one mission, to pop the world's most perfect popcorn. Though many had tried before him, no one else had the passion or the scientific know-how to make it happen. And when Redenbacher set out into the 20th century to change the popcorn landscape forever, the world would never be the same. So, today we're popping up the history of Orville Redenbacher. But before we get started, be sure to subscribe to the Weird History Food channel. And let us know in the comments below what other staple snack foods you would like to hear about. All right, you want an extra large bucket for just a quarter more? The people of the Americas have been eating unique varieties of popcorn for thousands of years, with the oldest known eras of cultivated popcorn dating back to 4,700 BC, Peru. Back then, entire cobs would be popped a variety of ways, sometimes by placing them directly on hot coals, sometimes by roasting them over open flames, and sometimes by placing them in earthen ovens. Different cultures likewise had different relationships with popcorn, some more spiritual than others. For instance, some Native American tribal folklore regarded the sound of kernels popping as a sign that the spirits within the corn were becoming angry. Meanwhile, the Aztecs used popped kernels for ceremonial bling, decorating themselves with popcorn garlands, just like elementary school students would do hundreds of years later. Still, it's commonly believed that popcorn was only ever eaten by ancient peoples as either a delicacy or as a small dietary supplement, never as a staple part of their diets. Or as your mom might say, that's snack food, not food food. While rumors that the pilgrims ate popcorn at the first Thanksgiving seem to be unfounded, Europeans were likely introduced to the treat early into their exploration of the North American continent, especially as French trappers formed relationships with the Iroquois in the Great Lakes region. Reportedly, the Iroquois would pop their popcorn kernels in sand-filled pottery jars, and the European settlers in both Quebec and what would become the northeastern United States quickly took to the practice too. Still, due to the variations between popcorn strains caused by adaptations to various environments, different regions had different strains of popcorn, and not all strains were created equal. So if your first handful of popcorn was from a dusty old corn stock, you might assume it all tastes like that and never touch the stuff again. Furthermore, popping popcorn remained cumbersome. They didn't have microwaves yet, so it was a lot of work for a little return. As a result, it seems that not even these early European settlers ate much of it. But luckily for us all, this latter issue would be resolved in the late 19th century, as a certain candy store owner came steamrolling into the picture. In 1885, Ohio-born, Chicago-based Charles Creeters invented the world's first ever commercial popcorn machine. This popcorn machine utilized a small steam engine to pop popcorn kernels in oil. And it marked the first time ever that seasoning could be evenly distributed over an entire batch of popcorn. What's more, it doubled as a nut roaster. Creeters' invention swept the nation, and it soon found its home at carnivals, on street corners, and in theaters everywhere, exploding ever more into the mainstream with Creeters' later invention of the horse-drawn popcorn wagon. While it may have seemed then that popcorn was at the top of its game, it was only getting started. When the Great Depression hit, popcorn's popularity grew to heights previously unimagined. Since a bag of popcorn at the time cost only 5 to 10 cents, it became a staple treat for cash-strapped Americans, especially as movie theaters proliferated across the country. Even then, popcorn wasn't done popping off. With the onset of World War II and the immediate sugar rationing that came with it, America's consumption of popcorn increased threefold from its Depression-era highs. For a few raucous years, popcorn was everywhere, and everyone was eating it all the time. But then, the war ended. The good times were back, people had money again, and sugar made its triumphant return to the home front. What's more, the rise of the television saw the decline of movie theater attendance, and the entire popcorn industry took it on the chin. Thus, in a tragic betrayal, Americans turned their collective back on popcorn, leaving it to go the way of ambrosia salad. On July 16th of 1907, Orville Redenbacher was born unto the world. He grew up on a small corn farm in Brazil, Indiana, and likewise from an early age, formed an obsession with the art of popcorn making, even selling his own. Hey, some kids are into baseball cards, some are into popcorn. He managed to put this obsession to rest, but he knew full well that he couldn't stay away from it for long. Orville went on to graduate near the top of his high school class, allowing him to pursue a degree in agronomy at Purdue University. Orville's only problem? He had no money for tuition. 
So, according to legend, Orville decided to skip the traditional summer job routine and to instead sell bags of popcorn all across the Indiana countryside from the back of his car. He apparently managed to hawk enough popcorn to pay for his time at Purdue. And it was a pretty swell time for old Orville. He ran for Purdue's track team, he played the sousaphone for Purdue's All-American Marching Band, and he enjoyed all the benefits that life with the Alpha Gamma Rho fraternity had to offer. Really, the sousaphone? It's like this guy was trying to be a trivial pursuit question. You should have seen him keg stand an entire barrel of melted butter. Upon graduating in 1928, Orville got a job with Vigo County, working for a time as Farm Bureau Extension Agent, responsible for educating rural farms in emerging agricultural sciences. It was during this time that Orville first developed a taste for fame. He became the first county agent to do his own educational radio broadcast, eventually leading him to pursue graduate work in radio communications at both Purdue and Colorado State. But Orville had greater ambitions than life as a bureaucrat had to offer. No stuffed shirt desk jockey ever went on to change the world of popcorn. So he started up his own fertilizer business on the side. This business eventually became so successful that Orville put the bureaucracy behind him and instead grew himself mountains of cash. In fact, it was just enough cash to let his old obsession come popping back into view. Orville Redenbacher's personal motto was, do one thing and do it better than anyone. Tragically, many later entrepreneurs would take the exact opposite approach. Although he'd found success with fertilizer and with working for the government, that one thing continued to be popcorn. As popcorn fell out of public favor in the post-war years, it was only gaining momentum within Orville's daily life. Though he had started selling his own popcorn again in 1944, it wasn't until 1951 that he and his business partner, fellow Purdue alumnus Charles F. Bowman, bought up Chester's and Sons, an existing seed corn plant. There, he began to experiment in the development of the perfect strain of popcorn. Ideally, one that won't catch on fire if you misjudge the cook time by three seconds. He would take existing strains of popcorn and crossbreed them, hoping to create the fluffiest, lightest popcorn ever to exist. And after supposedly creating over 10,000 new strains of popcorn, Orville finally found just the one he'd been looking for. He and Charles named the strain Red Bow, a combination of their names, Redenbacher and Bowman. Orville's newfound strain boasted a 44 to 1 ratio of pop to unpopped kernels. With Red Bow in hand, they knew they had something special, so they decided to take it to market. Initially, they planned to simply sell Red Bow popcorn under that name, because it's pretty good. You could picture that on a box. But after paying $13,000 to a Chicago-based advertising agency, they were advised to change their strategy. The ad people thought that the popcorn would sell better if they ditched the Red Bow name and attached Orville's own name and face to the product instead. They presumably made the suggestion while Charles Bowman was still in the room which is savage. Orville felt as though they had just thrown away $13,000. Later writing, I drove back to Indiana Riley thinking we had paid $13,000 for someone to come up with the same name my mother had come up with when I was born. But the partners ultimately decided to go with the agency's suggestion. And in 1970, Orville Redenbacher's gourmet popping corn finally launched. Though Orville's name would be attached to their new popcorn product, Charles would head the company for the four decades that followed. All the while, Orville would remain the company's head of scientific research. Still, with a personality like Orville's, the popcorn's namesake couldn't be kept in the lab all his life. If your product is headed up by a folksy old man, it is your responsibility to put that folksy old man on television. Orville made his first TV appearance in 1973. He went on the show to tell the truth, and the show's judges went head over heels for his popcorn right on national television. More importantly though, audiences everywhere took to Orville like popcorn to salt, and Orville's company was quick to capitalize on their lead scientist's sudden stardom. Soon after, they began to broadcast Orville's quaint and humble persona all over American airwaves. He'd always wear his trademark horn-rimmed glasses and bow tie, sometimes with one of his many grandkids, a boy named Gary Redenbacher, at his side. He looked more like a caricature of an old man than actual caricatures of old men. Reportedly, audiences found Orville to be so charming that many assumed he was an actor. Many even wrote to the company to ask if it was all for show, or if Orville was the real deal. 
To clear things up, the company then arranged for Orville to appear on multiple televised talk shows, just so he could explain his passion for popcorn to Americans everywhere. It was a huge success, and Orville's passion made America fall back in love with a crunchy snack they'd once adored. With Orville Redenbacher quickly becoming a household name, his namesake popcorn grew by the mid-1970s to capture about a third of the unpopped popcorn market. And in 1976, the company was bought by Hunt Wesson, only to then trade hands a handful of times over the decade and a half that followed, eventually ending up under the control of Conagra Brands. Hmm, those ad people were right. Orville Redenbacher still sounds better. Orville continued to star in commercials well into the 1980s, and in 1988, Orville's alma mater, Purdue, granted him an honorary doctorate for his contributions to the popcorn industry. Sadly, in 1995, Orville suffered a heart attack at the age of 88, causing him to drown in the jacuzzi of his California condo. You have to admit, though, that is an impressively baller tragedy. His ashes were scattered at sea. Shortly thereafter, famed movie critic Roger Ebert eulogized Orville, praising the seriousness with which he took the popcorn trade. Ebert's co-host, Gene Siskel, attributed popcorn's revival to Orville's ingenuity. Both acknowledged that Orville's influence forever changed the way we experience movies, with our cheeks full of buttery kernels. Almost two decades later, the city of Valparaiso, Indiana, where Orville did much of his popcorn experimentation, unveiled a life-sized statue of Orville in 2012 to further commemorate his achievements. And in the years since, Orville's namesake popcorn has continued to prosper. Today, it is the most popular single brand of American popcorn available, with Pop Secret in Act 2 duking it out for a distant second place. They still sell the classic popping kernels and Orville Redenbacher branded oils, along with many flavors of microwavable popcorn, a type of popcorn Orville distrusted throughout his entire life. Hey, we get it. He was an old school popper. Today, their microwavable popcorn lineup includes butter, ultimate butter, and movie theater butter, along with their more health conscious Smart Pop and Naturals lineups. They also now sell Skinny Girl popcorn, along with a whole array of popcorn related seasonings, including flavors like white cheddar, nacho cheese, and ranch, along with the less conventional Buffalo Wild Wings buffalo sauce and Cinnabon flavors. And Orville's cheerful, folksy face still graces nearly every Orville Redenbacher product to this day. Just don't let him see you use the microwave. So what do you think? Butter, kettle, caramel, or cheddar popcorn? Let us know in the comments below. And while you're at it, check out some of these other weird history food videos.